Joining us in the studio is Dr. Scott Jerome. He is director of sports cardiology at the University of Maryland Medical Center and assistant professor of medicine at the University of Maryland School of Medicine. Doctor, thank you for being with us. Thanks for inviting me. A lot, lot of history of um, cardiac cases involving sports, particularly football, that I, that I want to talk about. But more broadly, for um, young people, um, in athletic endeavors for the parents of those young people, what should they worry about? Yeah, there's a lot to worry about, right? Um, first of all, are they in condition? Do they have, entering the, the new season coming up, are they in shape to start their practices and things like that? Heat, it's a big thing in Maryland, right? We've had a tragedy many, a few years back that we want to prevent that from happening. Um, you look for change in symptoms change in family history of a, of a student athlete. So, you know, before they enter the field, you kind of want to screen them a little bit ahead of time. It, it's rare, right? Um, oh, it is. But, but when it happens that a, a young athlete in, in their prime has some sort of cardiac incident, it, it makes news because it's, you know, a horrible shock. Yeah, it, it is rare, but it makes the news, right? So it seems like it's blown up how many people are actually having Issues. How do we limit that risk? I know you're you're doing a screening this this week at a local college. How to walk us through that process? I mean, these it's a group of healthy kids for the most part. Right, right. How do you start screening to figure out who maybe needs more of a workup? Right. So they, they first can see their primary care physician, their pediatrician. In my case, I'm a sports cardiologist, so I'm in the second tier. Where they see a sports physician, which is different than a sports cardiologist, and they go through symptoms history and physical. They, are you short of breath? Are you lightheaded? Do you have palpitations? Have you ever passed out? Those are important symptoms for, to know about a person. Um, and then we do family history, which is really important. Did anybody in your family die suddenly? Is there something genetic that's being passed on that just hasn't presented to the athlete yet? Um, was there an auto accident, unexplained auto accident, unexplained drowning? Did someone early, b before the age of 50, have a defibrillator in place? Do they have a cardiomyopathy? So this family history is really important. And then the physical, right? Do they have a cardiac murmur? Do they have a structural deformity that may lead to heart disease? Or, or, and then that gets flagged, and then they get sent to me for, from the heart standpoint to kind of go through it, listen to that heart murmur. Are they born with a valve that's abnormal or something like that? You told me earlier one of the things you're looking for is um, exceptionally tall people. Yeah. Is there a, yeah. a special risk there? Yeah, there is. So we look at uh, basketball players, we look at volleyball players or, or a tall group of athletes. There's a couple syndromes. One is Marfans that you're born with. They're tall people um, that affects the aorta and the, the way all the blood vessels are stuck together. So we do screening on those people specifically. The typical sports physical that I, I guess most, most schools require, what, what does that consist of? Yeah, so it depends on the level. It usually isn't, you know, at junior high level. It's, you know, primary care pediatrician. As it goes up to high school, it gets a little more intense of what they're doing. They're listening a little better. They're taking a better family history there. And then at college level, that physical then becomes even more expansive. And you do some kind of testing and screening for that level. Because the, the level of intensity of the sports is higher at high school and, co and college. And testing can can be expensive. I, I guess a standard EKG doesn't doesn't really cost much, but you get into a stress test or echocardiogram. Yeah. Does it make sense as a as a screening tool for the average kid? Right. So you don't screen everybody, right? You get, if you have any of these red flags with the history, the physical, or, or family history, then you decide whether you're going to screen. And then these people who are at high risk, these people who are tall from our fans, those get usually get screening nowadays. Yeah, there have been a bunch of uh, cases in the news. You mentioned it was a young man from uh, this part of Baltimore County who was a college park as a football player who had heat stroke and wound up uh, dying from that, which led to some changes. Yeah. Um, there was a uh, case just a couple weeks ago, also this part of Baltimore County, 16-year-old died uh, after a football practice. Um, no autopsy report that, that I've heard of just yet on, on what happened to him. Um, you'd mentioned the, the, earlier the, the Brony James case. Right. Um, is, uh, so the, the heat stroke is distinct from somebody with a, a sudden cardiac problem. Right, right, right. So these, these kids will have all kinds of things that can happen to them. It's just not heart disease. Usually the sudden death or the sudden cardiac arrest where they just collapse on a court, that's usually cardiac. 
in origin. With the heat stroke, you know, we're a hot, humid. I don't think people took it as seriously a few years back until this tragic accident at, at uh, College Park. Uh, and now they, they, they look at the field, they look at the humidity, they look at the shade, they look at the wind. They have all kinds of parameters to decide, do we change practice indoors? Do we not have practice today? Hydration protocols. Uh, and then there's a thing called cold immersion that's got to be around now. So that's the treatment for heat. And they have that at the college level. Yeah, they do. Yeah. Let me remind our viewers, if you have a question about sports cardiology, give us a call at the number on the screen, or you can send an email to livequestions at mpt.org. You know, there was also the case a couple years ago, Pittsburgh Steelers player, and this was bizarre because he, uh, I think he was making a, a tackle, got hit in, in just the wrong spot at just yeah. the wrong time to stop his heart. Yeah. And, and he was revived thanks to a defibrillator. Right, right. And that, that's, believe it or not, we see that in Little League. It's a small object that hits just at the right timing. And I probably hit the microphone. But, but right at the right timing that puts you into a thing called ventricular fibrillation, which is a deadly rhythm. But we see it in lacrosse, hockey, and baseball. So the Little League baseball, the younger kids, they have soft balls. It's not because of the they don't want to get hit in the head, which they don't want to do, but because of these chest impacts that can happen. So we see that in other sports, yeah. But luckily, there was an AED available. So what else can, can local schools and Little League and Pee Wee football, what, what else can they do? What else should they be doing to in, ensure a safe environment? Right, so the safe environment, you have to have a, what they call an EAP, Emergency Action Plan. So it's a protocol, what to do when something bad happens. Now this thing can't be something that, oh, we wrote a policy, we put it up on the shelf and no one knows about it, right? These things happen. So it's gotta be practiced, rehearsed a couple times a year. Everybody's gotta know what to do. When, with the EAP, Emergency Action Plan. I, I, you know, it's horrible to say, but you know, with school shootings that are happening, kids know what to do now, right? So the EAP, the coaches, the parent, everybody involved, the trainers, need to know what to do with the EAP. Um, and it's got to, like I said, it's gotta be rehearsed and practiced. Then they have to have defibrillators. And you just, again, can't have the defibrillator locked in some office that's, uh, you know, 20 minutes away. It's gotta be accessible to the field. You gotta get that, on as quick as you can. So those are what the schools need to do. And, and, and then the other part is they gotta be trained, right? You just can't have the AED, but no one knows how to use it. Or So people have to be trained in these devices. Yeah, and which are quick, extremely quick, simple, but you, simple. you need to know how to open the simple. box. And right, people can't be afraid of it. You gotta open the box, you put on some patches. It's voice commands, it walks you through it. Um, it's pretty idiot proof. So don't be afraid of it. If something bad happens, you see an AED wherever you are, whether it's an airport or an athletic field, use it. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm worried that we're painting this really dire picture of sports and, and young people because for, for the most part, for 99.9 some percent, uh, participating in sports is a great benefit. Yeah. Tell, hey, tell us about that. Yeah, so in the youth, I think it's a great benefit. We've got an uh, obesity problem with our youth, right? So by p participating in sports, they benefit so much. They benefit from the obesity. So they're not sitting there doing video games. They're out playing sports, right? But then the sports, besides the physical part of it, they get a lot of mentoring from the coach. They get uh, mentorship. They get teamwork, learning camaraderie. They learn sportsmanship. They learn a lot. And then hopefully, and then, and then the other thing they learn is how to manage time, because they've got to do academics, they've got to do sports, uh, they've got to sleep well, they've got to recover. Uh, how do you manage this stress? And you've got to eat right, right? So hopefully this is the springboard for adulthood, because adulthood is the same thing, school, job, same thing, right? Um, so you've got to be able to exercise, you've got to be able to eat right, you've got to be able to sleep, you've got to stress management, all, all these things come into, you know, if you learn it when you're in middle school, then you learn it in high school, you learn it in college, you go into adulthood, Hopefully you got this, this down. I don't know that we've ever talked to a sports cardiologist before. When, when did that become a specialty? Uh, probably about 20 years ago. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. It wasn't official. Um, there wasn't official training 20 years ago. We were kind of all self-taught. Now it's a big deal. Now the American College of Cardiology has got uh, all kinds of conferences and it's on every lecture circuit now because it's become so prevalent. What attracted you to the field? Um, so I, I'm... You More trained did, as a cardiologist. I trained right? as a cardiologist, but I did a lot of sports in my, my youth. I still cycle and do some things like that. And this kind of happened by accident. Uh, um, a coach that was a patient said, boy, I had a, 
a kid that passed out on a basketball court. Can you see him? And I said, wow, this is really interesting. And then it kind of took off from there. Now, it's just not kids I see. I see athletes of all ages, so 65, 70, they're cyclists, they're doing triathlons. Um, yeah, so it's, it's all age groups. Or the, the, the issues are certainly different because at that age you, you have a lifetime worth of uh, crud potentially accumulated yeah, right. in your arteries. Right. So what happens to a, a high school, college kid, what, what the disease processes that can be is totally different than a 40-year-old. Um, so, and then somewhere in that age group, 35, 40, they, they kind of merge a little bit. It could be a little bit of both. In the, the population of your older sports cardiology patients, would, would you say their, their hearts are healthier overall from, from a you know, coronary artery disease they're, they're not necessarily better, right? I mean, people well, who do athletics. Right, no, no, no. Treadmill. People who do <laughs> athletics, you know, in their midlife and later life, they live longer, they have less heart attacks, they do really well. But they still, they're not bulletproof, so they still get coronary artery disease. And, you know, a lot of them think they're bulletproof. I don't, you know, I'm a runner. Uh, I'm not going to get anything. But so they have to be aware that, boy, if you're having something in your chest, you probably need to get, get it looked at. You're not bulletproof. And do they sometimes hesitate to do that? They do. They do. But what they don't hesitate when their performance drops. Then they come. They say, boy, I used to run a whatever, you know, a 12-minute mile. Now, I, you know, it's taking me 15 minutes. Something's not right. Or if they have a symptom, because that's what's important to them is their performance at Let's whatever level. Circle back to, to young people and, and uh, high school sports, maybe, for parents watching or, or gra grandparents. What, what's the takeaway here? Say that again? For what, what should they know, parents of a I think, young I think, athlete? Well, I think you've got to be aware, right? Look for some change some change in symptoms, did they pass out, are they complaining of something, lack of energy. Um, I, I look for the change and I would also look for something in the family history, if the family sees that. And, and, ma and manage stress in these kids. And start with your uh, uh, general practitioner, family medicine. Right, and depending on the age, pediatrician. Yeah. Very good, Dr. Scott Jerome is director of sports cardiology at the University of Maryland Medical Center. Doctor, we appreciate your time, thank you. Thank you. Your health segments are a co-production of Maryland Public Television and the University of Maryland Medical System.